Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ Weekly Market Update. This is our last update for February, if you can believe it. It's February 28th, 2023. I'm Ken Animo, Chief of Analytics over here at DAT, uh, joined by Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst. Good morning, Dean. Hey, good morning. Just us today. No guests. Yeah, it's unusual. We'll be back at it uh, next week, though, with our special guest, Cody Kohler from ANZ Trucking. I know. I won't. Yeah. Cody's a Buckeye fan, if I remember correctly, a very big Buckeye right. fan. I'd be remiss right. if I didn't mention that. We all kind of are at heart, but right. we just might not know right. it. Um, but I won't be here next week. I'll be in the air on the way to Denver. We're having our customer advisory board meeting. Mm. I am so thoroughly looking forward to that. Uh, it's a really great group, um, and I can't wait to spend some time uh, learning more about how we can help deliver value. It's going to be great. You're going to be there, Dean. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. The last one at... Um DATCON was amazing. It was my first customer advisory board group with the brokers. I was amazed at uh, how much uh, dialogue there was and how much, uh, particularly how much I'd learned about the industry. I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I always, new folks getting acclimated, we just got, we had a trip to Chicago a couple weeks ago. And the number one thing I get from newbies is how open people are to the challenges they're facing. And even though they might seem like competitors, it's a very um, open dialogue. To, yeah. the, to, to expand the industry. I think everyone's out there trying to do their own thing and generate their own right. business. But I think there's this overwhelming sense of collaboration to expand um, trustworthiness and acceptance in the brokerage and intermediary uh, space. So mm -hmm. that's what I love about this industry because you see it across all facets, right? I um, do. So that's yep. super fun. All right, so we're gonna get into it because we've got a lot to cover. So I'm gonna hop into our key points of the week, which are over here. I know it may seem like I'm always reading them these for the first time, and by and large, that's because I am. Just kidding. Uh, so spot rates are tracking very closely to 2018 levels, especially flatbed. Uh, we have a very flatbed-focused question of the week with like two absolute fire charts to share with you at the end. So I highly recommend sticking around um, until our question of the week. Uh, dry van active contract rates are flat, um, while the Q4 replacement rates are down a little over 10%. Something very interesting to watch is the market sort of completes its normalization cycle. We might see spot rates bottoming and continuing to bottom, but contract rates still have some more steam to give up, so to speak. Uh, American Trucking Association's Jan Tonnage Index is up uh, roughly three quarter of a percent month over month and 1.5% uh, year over year. That's the second sequential gain. We are going to start lapping more favorable comps. You're going to the broken record on that, but you're going to hear us keep saying that all year. Um, some really positive news coming out of those West Coast labor talks. Um, uh, agreement reached on many points. We're hoping to get a deal there soon. That would be terrific heading into spring. Uh, January, average Class 8 used truck price is down 20%. Um, that's coming out of our friends at ACT Research. And then last week's weather impacts are minimal. Uh, and this is the two-year anniversary of Texas and the polar vortex and all of that freezing over. So something to keep in mind as we move along. I'm going to turn it over to Dean now to get us into our market update. Dean? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Yeah, unlike uh, two years ago, the market uh, didn't really get un upset at a national level last week. Uh, we'll cover some of the impacts at a regional level. There were some weather impacts as a result of Olive and uh, Piper, both winter storms working their way from coast to coast. So let's start with uh, load to truck ratio and dry band. Load post down 10% last week. Um, volumes are still about 18% higher than the long-term average for week eight just to put that into perspective, uh, still about 65% lower than a year ago. So keep in mind, even though they're down year over year, as Ken mentioned, some of the comps aren't too favorable at the moment, we're still seeing more spot volume than we would normally for a week eight. Equipment posts are still at very high levels. Um, low to truck ratio last week, down slightly from 2.48 to 2.29. In the refrigerated category, spot volumes continue to decline, down 6% last week. Uh, like dry van, about 70% lower than this time last year. A lot of that it's being driven by lower produce volumes. Weekly truckload volumes are down about 11%, and almost the same as the weekly volumes the USDA was reporting in 2017. Load to truck ratio down from 3.5 to 3.37. And in flatbed, after increasing for most of January, uh, low posts last week plateaued. Um, in fact, they've been about the same as they have been in the last two weeks. Uh, volumes are still about 80% lower than a year ago. Um, it's the lowest recorded in seven years for week eight. So definitely lots of lower volume, uh, you know, data points dropping out at the moment. Uh, rates are still increasing as we'll cover a little bit later. So the load to truck ratio in flatbed, 13.93, 
down to two, uh, 12.62, so another slight increase, uh, decrease there. Have a look at some of the markets. Uh, we'll start on the West Coast. Winterstorm Olive left hundreds of truckers stranded on I-80 last week. If you're following some of the social media stories, of course, Mother Nature's reminding us that she still has a few uh, tricks up her sleeve after a lot of us were thinking that spring was around the corner and Winter was a bit of a, a dud this year. Um, the first blizzard warning in California in 30 years, lots of widespread load cro uh, closures. Strawberry farmers lost a lot of their crops due to freezing temps. Um, Minnesota and Michigan blanketed by winter storm Olive and soon to be Piper coming in now. It'll drop another six to 10 inches this week on top of the foot last week. Outbound dry band rates in Minneapolis were up just two cents a mile to $1.93 last week. Load posts are up 20% across markets impacted by olive when you have a look at the, all of them from Northern California all the way to uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, spot rates remain relatively flat, though, when you look at that swath of cold temperature and bad weather, so not a lot of impact like we saw back two years ago when the polar vortex gripped the country. Um, the weather impact in California, which has been hardest hit, uh, minimal at $1.86 for all outbound loads in California. Last week's state average was identical to 2018 levels, but close to where we normally see spot rates out of that state on a seasonal basis. San Diego was the only market that reported a gain last week. Dry van rates up a penny per mile to $1.74. On some of the lanes, Los Angeles to Stockton, one of the busiest in the spot market, are still at their lowest in 12 months at $2.37 per mile. Remember, folks, these are line haul rates excluding fuel. Uh, that rate of 237 is about 40% lower than they were a year ago and 40 cents a mile lower than last month's average. Loads to Phoenix, one of the busy lanes we saw during the pandemic and the retail import boom, um, sitting at 233 a mile this week. That's $1.65 a mile lower than this time last year and the weakest in 12 months. So having a look around some of our markets, um, average reefer spot rates out of Florida where produce season is just starting to get its legs. Um, outbound reefer rates at $1.41 per mile last week, still 85 cents a mile lower than this time a year ago. Uh, only the Jacksonville market was reporting a gain last week, rates up 32 cents a mile to $2.14. In Lakeland, the largest produce market in the state where strawberry season um, is sort of getting ramped up ahead of the Plant City Strawberry Festival, uh, spot rates for loads to Atlanta were $1.29 per mile. Uh, that's just over a dollar mile per lower than this time last year. Um, in McAllen, another big import market for produce um, from Mexico, spot rates were flat at $2.12 per mile last week despite a 16% week-over-week increase in load posts. One of the lanes I watch out of McAllen is Mexico imports to Hunts Point, New York. So it's the McAllen to Brooklyn market lane. So far this month, they've dropped by 40 cents a mile to $2.03. Loads north to Chicago out of McAllen followed a similar trend at $1.73 per mile. That's just over a dollar per mile lower than this time last year. Loads to Philly out of McAllen at $1.93 were also the weakest in 12 months. One of our big markets for refrigerated spot market volume is Atlanta. Loads on our number one market lane to Orlando at $2.93 were also the lowest in 12 months and also a dollar per mile lower than this time last year. Spot rates in the opposite direction. It's a very busy dedicated lane for reefer carriers running back and forward. Orlando to Atlanta at $1.29 per mile. Uh, when you look at the round trip miles on that lane, Atlanta, Orlando, Atlanta, average trip revenue for reefer carriers is about $2.07 per mile, slightly above break-even costs for the average reefer carrier. And whilst we're almost midway through Lent, uh, those observing the religious tradition will also uh, abstain from eating meat, of course, that pumps up the volume of fish. Uh, one of the data points that's always fascinating is we see a lot of uh, import volume not import volume necessarily, but a lot of uh, volume coming into Seattle. Um, a lot of the McDonald's filet of fish, which is a substitute uh, for meat on Fridays, accounts for about 25% of sales for McDonald's during the period of Lent. A lot of that's Alaskan Pollock. It's caught, processed, frozen within hours and shipped out of the Seattle market. Uh, we've still got an oversupply truckload capacity market um, in Seattle. Normally, we see spot rates take off during Lent. Um, this year, it's quite the opposite. Loads to Los Angeles out of Seattle at a buck eight per mile, 80 cents a mile lower year over year. One of the other big lanes out of Seattle is Phoenix. Uh, reefer rates at a dollar and two per mile were half what they were a year ago. Having got our flatbed market, uh, Minnesota was particularly hard hit by winter storm Olive last week. Rates up 11 cents per mile to a state average of 204. Most of the state's gains came from the South 
St. Cloud market spot rate spike there, increasing by 72 cents a mile to $3.68. In the Pacific Northwest, also battered by heavy snow, Portland recorded its second snowiest day ever last Wednesday. Capacity was particularly tight, pushed outbound rates up to $2.48 per mile out of Portland. And looking at the state level rates, Oregon rates uh, at an average of $2.71 were up 30 cents a mile week over week. Uh, outbound Florida rates continue to improve, increasing by six cents a mile to $1.69 last week. Solid gains were reported in the state's largest flatbed market in Lakeland, where spot rates at $1.61 were up by 10 cents a mile last week. Remember, a lot of that volume in Lakeland moves within the state. Loads to Miami were steady at 5.40 a load. Uh, loads north to Jacksonville were uh, the highest since October at 4.41 per load. Having a look at our year over year look at spot rates, um, another penny per mile decrease last week placed dry van rates at 90 cents per mile lower than this time last year. The national average was $1.74 per mile last week as that sector looks uh, searches for a bottom. Uh, dry van low and haul rates have increased by about uh, decreased by about 12% year to date. Uh, based on the volume of loads moving, the average rate for the top 50 dry van lanes was 22 cents a mile higher than the national average. The top 50 lanes averaged $1.96 per mile last week. In the refrigerator category, after dropping by 33 cents a mile since the start of the year, the national average reefer line haul rate plateaued last week at 204. Uh, reefer spot rates are precisely a dollar per mile lower than this time last year. And wrapping up with flatbed, spot rates continue to climb uh, following last week's penny per mile gain. National average flatbed line haul rates ended the week at just over $2.13. That represents an increase of five cents a mile over the last month and two cents a mile since the start of the year, stark contrast to uh, refrigerated and dry van. The similarities with the 2018 flatbed market are hard to ignore with last week's national average just a penny per mile higher. Flatbed rates are still 50 cents a mile lower than this time last year, but remain promising as spot rates uh, in the other two categories retreat. So that's it for this week's market update. If you'd like to find out more about what's happening in freight, go to dat.com forward slash market update and download our weekly report, which will be published this evening. And with that, it's over to Ken for the short-term forecast. <clears throat> so interesting factoid about Lent um, and eating meat. Uh, back in the days of the mountain men out west, um, the, they received special dispensation from the Pope to classify beaver as uh, fish so they could eat it on Lent because that was the main uh, subsistence part of their diet was um, uh, the meat from the beaver pelt industry. So next time you're wondering... Uh, filet of fish or you can have um, you know, a beaver tail in a crock pot and you're good to go. So let's get to our short-term forecast, making its triumphant return from last week. So let's just level set. We start with dry van. It's long haul only, greater than 550 miles, excluding fuel. The blue line is historical data. It's a seven-day weighted moving average, which means we take all the line haul over the last seven days, divided by all the miles driven. That's what gets the rate each point. Then we have five four, four forecasts for you. We've got green, which is rate cast. That's what's in all of our products. We've got red, which is a short term, which more heavily weights near term data. Um, and then we've got um, gray and yellow, which are blends of the two. Those are what we call our blended forecasts. So there's some uh, agreement here, at least through the first week or two of the forecast. And then it really gets, um, it gets a little bit suspicious, if you will, uh, as we get maybe into the middle of March. Uh, rate cast is pulling us out of this uh, malaise we have um, at least slowing it down as we get into spring shipping peak in produce and then the short-term forecast isn't having it it's basically saying we go break through a dollar fifty by the end of the forecast period again i'm more optimistic i think raycast probably has a better idea of what's going to happen over these next few weeks but we'll keep tracking it and keeping y'all informed Moving on to reefer, there's a lot of disagreement, and I really tend to agree with Raycast more here. In fact, I think even Raycast could be a little bit pessimistic um, with some of the warmer temperatures that Dean has mentioned in prior updates. And this one, I think we could potentially see a earlier start to some uh, produce shipping. Um, so I think this one's maybe a little bit more pessimistic. But again, it's the same chart. It's just for reefer. And I think the short-term forecast is really, really penalizing some of this near-term data um, that it's seeing. And then flatbed. It's going to be the perfect segue into our question of the week, uh, but the forecasts are pretty much in agreement. And if anything else, the short-term forecast is being a little bit pessimistic about where rates are going to head. Um, again, we're going to talk about this at length here as soon as we bring Dean back, but I, I think there's 
there's a lot of forces, right, pulling at the flatbed market in different directions. So it's going to be a really tricky thing to forecast um, over the next few weeks and months, maybe even quarters, um, which is exactly why we're going to bring Dean back right now and get to our question of the week. Dean? Yeah, thanks, Ken. So uh, question of the week is, what's the out outlook for flatbed spot rates now the housing construction sector has cooled off? Um, we had uh, Dustin Jalbert on our show and Ibrahim Bayan um, in the last few weeks, and they talked a lot about the uh, you know the positive side of the industry. Although Dustin did say that the housing market had had uh, decreased substantially, the one thing that Ken I keep seeing, and we covered this um, in a, an interview with Bill Cassidy in the Journal of Commerce, uh, we had a particularly warm January in the Northeast. And, um, you know, it's a big part of the population, probably about a third of the population. Um, I've sort of, you know, if you go from D.C. all the way up to Maine. Uh, one thing I saw, and I always look for this out on the highways, is I saw a lot of flatbed freight moving that requires holes to be dug. And uh, normally the ground freezes up here and you can't dig holes. A lot of construction activity went on through January. You know, light poles, fire hydrants, uh, people, you know, starting digging holes, starting new residential dwellings. So I just think that was part of why we saw a lot more volume. Uh, but, of course, we've just had a pretty big cold snap and we've got snow and, you know, cold temps across the entire you know, second and third tier of the country. That's certainly going to slow down flatbed volumes, I think, um, as we start March uh, tomorrow. But um, I think the fortunes, we can throw up a couple of those charts, Ken, that we could probably talk to. Um, the first chart is the uh, data point I've been plotting over the last couple of years, which is the relationship between housing starts, uh, single family housing starts in particular, which are the most flatbed intensive from a freight perspective and building permits, which tend to lead housing starts uh, by, you know, something like one to two months. Um, and you can see there, if you follow the data points, the, uh, the interesting trend is that uh, we can see the pandemic there in particular around April. You can see the the big drop in, um, I think it was flatbed line haul rates are in red. So the green is the national single family permits and the blue is the single family housing starts from the US Census Bureau. They both uh, bottomed out in April. And then we saw this incredible tight correlation between the two all the way through, uh, in fact, still going on right now, although... Uh, permits and volume, uh, housing starts are down somewhere in the order of 30% year over year, we are seeing flatbed rates reverse that trend that they've had for a little while. So I think the uh, whilst we've seen, uh, we've rode that roller coaster uh, ride of the you know residential housing boom in the last two years, I think what we'll see, Ken, is pretty good volumes in, ref in the flatbed market as opposed to reefer and dry van because of something that a large carrier told me last week uh, and he said, we're seeing a lot more volume in the market that's related to large infrastructure bill projects. And, uh, and I thought that was interesting. Some of that volume is coming from Mexico for things like light poles. And that explains, I think, in part why we're seeing pretty good volumes and rates in Texas in particular. So if that's the case, then, uh, and the infrastructure bill projects are starting to find their way into the freight market in 2023, uh, that could be a good uh, offset to the lower volumes of single family housing. I, this chart's fascinating to me. I mean, this is every single thing you want to have in a predictive leading indicator, right? You can see how it leads. Now, look, it's not perfect, right? There are pockets you can see in there in late 19, in late 20, and then in mid 21, where, you know, in any good leading indicator, you're when it shifts, you're going to see a time where it's not exactly caught up. It decouples a little bit. So it's very far from perfect, but um, it is just really a good um way to show that at a national level how tied uh, right. to housing starts. And I bet you if we were really going to get fancy with this and work in like rig count, housing starts, and I don't know, large civic and commercial construction projects, you'd get a much even tighter correlation just because those are the main drivers of flatbed. But I really do think um, this is a powerful way to look at where the market is heading. And look, we're, we're, we're seemingly sitting on the pre precipice of another decoupling, right? Where we're seeing strength in the flatbed market, even though mm -hmm. housing um, is collapsing. So it causes us as analysts to wonder where's that strength going to come from. And it might very well be, like you said in a prior episode, like the light poles and stuff like that mm -hmm. for the infrastructure mm -hmm. act. Right. Um, it's, so also, really Ken, it's also, you know, we're, we're just ahead of planting season. 
and again, if it, I mean, just one data point, uh, you know, one person making observations out there on the highways, but you start to see a lot of, you know, corn planting machinery, combine harvesters, broad acre farm tractors moving, um, a lot of steel moving for construction because March is typically the peak in machinery imports and steel production. So I think it's any surprise that we're starting to see some of that spring volume move ahead of warmer temperatures. I think some of the optimism around winter not being as severe this year uh, led a lot more shippers to start moving things. Um, and of course, in flatbed, you need pretty good weather to move a lot of materials, um, move it quickly. So yeah, I think a lot of optimism in the flatbed market, even though volumes are way down in the spot market, uh, from a rate perspective, carriers have certainly got a lot more optimism certainly at the national rate level. I think regionally that's a much bigger story for carriers. We're seeing pretty strong rates out of markets like Montgomery and, uh, you know, Al Alabama markets in particular, uh, well north of 350 a mile as a state average uh, yeah. for those regional loads. Which is a good segue to the next one, which we just refreshed our long-term rate outlook. Um, right. This one's flatbed. Um, a bunch of people asked for the drive-in and reefer last week, and we were able to send that out. So shoot, I ask IQ at DAT.com and note if you want to get or you reach out to us on LinkedIn. We, these are fresh as of last week. If you want the other two equipment types, just let us know. Um, this is very similar to the short-term charts, the blue lines historical. The shaded backdrop is the year-over-year -year change, which is where you can see the freight cycle that we talk about all the time. And then instead of having different modeling ensembles, this one is rate casts three primary outputs. So if you go into our products, the RFP tool or rate view or any of those products with rate cast, you get three outputs. You get essentially a base case, which is blue, a bull case, which is the up, you know, the optimistic case, which is green, and then the bear case, which is red. Um, so what you can see here is the the base case really isn't buying it, right? It's basically saying we're going to see a strong spring, and then things are going to slide back down. The, the bear case is a little bit pessimistic. It's probably reading a little bit too much into that housing data, and it's dropping rates all the way down to COVID levels, like the COVID shutdown levels. I really think that we're going to end up somewhere, and we've been tracking somewhere between the base case and the upside case, the green line. So somewhere between the blue and green line is where I would expect rates to, to travel over most of the next year. But curious your thoughts, Dean. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, you know, especially in flatbed, I think um, my sort of take on the year is going to be rates will be certainly flat in the first six half overall when you think about, you know, there will be ups and downs for sure. But I think that we still have a lot of capacity in the market in total. The difference with flatbed having a little bit more positivity is it's a more specialised uh, sector of the industry. You don't see a lot of interchangeability between dry van and reefer like you uh, like you do over the course of produce season. Um, and for those, you know, new, uh, that state that means that a lot of reefer carriers haul dry van freight for a good chunk of the year. And then when produce season pops, they can switch over to the reefer market. Can't do that in flatbed, although you can haul onions and some other produce on flatbeds. Um, it's primarily, you know, one trailer to one truck type rule. A lot of the trailers require specialized equipment. So you don't see the capacity fluctuations in flatbed that you normally do in dry van and reefer. And that's why I think there'll be a lot more stability in the rates this year. Um, given the ups and downs, you know, the, the downs are, of course, the lower volumes in housing. The ups are, uh, as we mentioned, with the infrastructure bill starting to push a lot more volume of steel in particular into those um, bridge construction projects and railings needed for all the new highway mileage. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of risk in flatbed, right? It's, it's so if, if we see a collapse in oil, um, like some are expecting, and we see housing continue to be slow and maybe some of the infrastructure stuff doesn't move as fast as we think, you know, there could be very well be a situation where it's a lot worse than we're expecting, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you don't tend to get um, specialization, I guess is my, my point here. Specialization seems to have the cuts both ways. Whereas you could see a flatbed market that's done well when driving and reefer are, are not doing well, right? Cause they're much more subject to broader economic conditions. Whereas on the other side, when we're expecting a recovery in the tail half of this year with uh, reefer and flatbed, I'm sorry, reefer and drive in, you could very well see flatbed lag behind if oil and housing continue to struggle. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, so we get to some, some questions? questions? Yeah. All right. So um, one question um, that's popped in here, do you guys uh, from Kamikaze Productions, do you guys mix in contract freight? cancelling changing spot market prices um, so yeah these are all we're just talking today on these charts about uh, spot market price changes line haul excluding fuel um, 
but I guess the question is probably a little bit deeper than that, Ken. Uh, maybe he's looking at the broader broader market changes, given contract freight is about 90% of volume hauled. So what I think in every other freight cycle, I'm pretty sure we've shown this chart many times. If you look at year-over-year change or spot and contract, there really hasn't been an example in our recorded history of it, of, of spot rates flattening and, and contract coming all the way down to meet it. Oh, okay. There is a market dynamic that almost necessarily means that spot rates will start to climb as contract rates are still falling and they'll meet. It's, er, it's erroneous to say they'll meet in the middle because that's not the case. They will, it, spot rates will catch contract as contract is coming down. Spot rates should start to go back up. And so you'll see, I can't do it in a camera in a way that makes sense. But just imagine spot rates starting to come up and contract rates continuing to come down, albeit at a slower pace. They'll intersect, which should start then pulling contract rates back up. The one thing to keep in mind, um, contract rates are largely a forward-looking manifestation of the current spot environment when the contract is executed. Right. If you're covering freight very easily out there at very low prices, you're going to be lower priced, less aggressive in your RFPs. If you're out there paying through the nose for freight and you can't find a truck and spot rates are at huge premiums, you're going to be much more conservative when you're pricing contract freight, which means you're going to pump the rate up. So that's why contract lead spot. Right. And that's why. Um, when the market's soft like this, the new rates coming in, we talk about contract replacement rate a lot, the new rates coming in will be lower than the old rates they're replacing, right? So that's how I would think about it is yeah. we've probably got some more ground to lose on contract. We should start to gain some year-over-year -year ground on spot. That would be my yep. current yeah. assessment of things. It's It's been tracking the, you know, remember Enam and Chris Kaplitz, um told us when they, uh, first joined the company a few years ago, said that contract typically follows spot on a four to six month lag. Uh, that certainly was the case last year when spot rates started to come down in February. And then by about August, contract rates were starting to turn uh, from, you know, increasing to decreasing consistently. I expect uh, that'll be the same this year. Uh, contract rates are still heading down, even though dry van rates uh, are certainly searching for a bottom right now. Uh, we expect that four to six month lag to follow. All right, next question, um, Matt. Oh, yes, so Matt's asking about the long term for Van and Reefer. Yes, we will get those done for you, Matt. Um, Nick Patel asks, uh, do you think there are indicators for each equipment type, housing, building permits for flatbeds, produce for reefers? Um, generally, yes, uh, Nick, uh, flatbed in particular, we've just covered the building permits and housing starts, very strong correlations there. Same with refrigerated weekly truckload volumes from the USDA. Uh, on the flat, on the dry van side, Ken, um, I, I mean, the purchasing managers index, uh, a lot of the publicly available uh, data from the uh, FRED database uh, tend to be good indicators of dry van. Um, there's a lot. Um, I wouldn't say there's any one in particular, but I know one that Nick Patel should be very familiar with. It's low to truck ratio. Yep. Exactly. The single greatest predictive tool available to like if your job was dependent on predicting month over month or week over week changes in the national dry van long haul yep. line haul rate, you should be using low to truck ratio. Now, Again, we say that because it's interesting for analytics. Very few, very few people's jobs are literally dependent on predicting national line haul rates. I mean, no one's ever gotten, no one, no broker has ever picked up the phone and said, I have a US to US shipment. Can you help me? <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. Right. Yeah. Um, these are to, these are to help understand broader trends. Like where's the market heading over the next quarter? What should my RFP posture be? What should my staffing levels be? Should I be optimistic or pessimistic about headcount and hiring? Those are all the things the national trends are useful for. Um, and for that, again, low to truck ratio, MCI are very useful. Then the, gen the generic industrial production is incredibly powerful predict for predicting national drive in line haul rates. Uh, PPI, as you mentioned, logistics managers index, producer yeah. price index. Um, what's the one that two people put out? Market puts out one and uh, IMI. Um, the IHS market and uh, ISM. So yeah. Thinking, uh, yeah. 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 So those indexes are, are very um, helpful yeah. as well. 
remember we had uh, Professor Jason Miller from uh, Michigan State University independently look at loader truck ratio and its impact on spot rates. Uh, this was about two years ago, uh, certainly early early pandemic data sets. It showed that a one unit increase in loader truck ratio showed a 11, 11 cents per mile increase in dry van rates. And on the way down, a one unit decrease in loader truck ratio uh, correlated with a six cents per mile drop in dry van rates. Very strong correlations in dry van, not as much in reefer and flatbed, but certainly very, very strong in dry van. Uh, it's a great indicator of uh, directionality of rates in uh, dry van. Uh, Amy McIntyre asks, Ken, where do we expect the bottom of van rates to be? The million dollar question. I'd love to know that answer. We're probably pretty much there on the spot side. Um, Close, yeah. One of the most trusted, you know, my trusted uh, colleagues in the industry I had a chance to sit down and speak with last week and they keep bringing back the fact that they can't really go much lower. I mean, you will start mm -hmm. to see like right. extreme um, implications for the driver pool at large, the owner operator pool, I should say at large, if they go much lower contract rates. This could be a compound answer to multiple questions because I think contract rates do have quite a bit of, I mean, I think most folks operating contract rate are still doing really, really well and they're still mm -hmm. probably, a lot of steam to come out of that. You got to remember, I mean, we show these charts, but when you look at spot versus contract, it, it, I, contract is still what, Dean? Only barely year over year negative? Yeah, it's, um, it's the spread between the two is 44 cents. I looked at all in rates today. It was 308 a year ago. It's 288 today, including fuel. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to run the numbers tomorrow, but through February, yep. uh, I don't have February, through January, contract was only down 7% year over year. Yep. Spot down 30% year over year. So yep. that ha I mean, look, I, this isn't like, um, this isn't us being predictive. I, I'm just saying that literally for the market to be considered in any kind of recovery, both those things have to intersect, right? Mm. The, if things stay year over year negative forever, they eventually go through zero, right? They will, they will go to zero and below it if, if it's always, right? If you lose 10 pounds per year and you weigh 100 pounds in your 11th year, you'll be negative 10 pounds, right? That's a, that, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. So those two things will have to intersect. I just think there's quite a bit of ways between them still for that to happen. So if you're a contract carrier, especially if you're a contract carrier on a fuel recapture program, you're still doing very well right now. Um, and that's 85 to 90 percent of the market if you are fully exposed to the spot market and have been for the last year hopefully you saved quite a bit of cash from the market that was 20 and 21 and 22 the first part of 22 um, but you're you're feeling it now you're probably losing money on a considerable portion of your loads right team i mean would you agree yep. with that from a full absolutely absolutely right. yep uh, last question, Ken, uh, before we wrap up. The logistics monk asked, as a sales rep, I'm finding that RFPs are being pushed forward to spring instead of late last year, I guess. Um, has there been a drop in contract rates that are over a 1,000 miles? So this is interesting. Hmm. Uh, yes, of course, there's been a drop in all contract rates. Um, right. First, I'll answer the second part of your question, and then Dean can maybe help me answer the first part, which is, I think it's an interesting strategy. We're, we're seeing a lot of shippers through our roundtable want to push the contract length longer, which makes a ton of sense. When rates are really, really high and they're taking it on the chin a little bit, they want to shorten the contract length because they're hopeful that when they get to the end of that contract, the market has improved. Right now, I think they're really trying to find bottom and lock in for as long as possible, right? If I'm a shipper and I had 100% control in the next three to six months, I would lock in a 25-year contract. <laughs> Right. If you had absolute control over what happened, you would lock in at the absolute market bottom. So I do think they're pulling, you know, some of that late fall, early spring stuff into the probably closer to the fourth of July. That's where I think a lot of shippers are expecting things to fully bottom out. So if they're lucky, carriers will be willing to lock in <clears throat> somewhere in the next three to four months for a twelve month contract. Because by the end of that twelve month contract, spot rates will almost certainly have improved and they won't face higher rates for the next 14 to 18 months, right, conceivably, because it takes so long to get that in place. But that's my thought. And I, th I think the other thing, Ken, is that we've heard from uh, shippers that they're strategically pushing more contract volume into the spot market direct via brokers. 
Uh, so that is, I suspect, in that part of the market, there's a lot more capacity and there's a lot more downward pressure on rates. The the natural tendency, of course, on those low volume lanes is to shift them to the spot market where they'll be substantially cheaper than the contract rate. So I think you know, the logistics monk is onto something there. I suspect it's more to do with increasing volumes in the spot market on lower volume lanes rather than uh, the trend that we've heard from shippers, which is they're sticking with their incumbent carriers and locking in capacity. Um, on those high volume lanes, as Ken mentioned. Yeah, and I love the name. So shout out to Logistics Monk. Hopefully, you become a regular on the show. All right, Dean, we're running way long. Let's get to let's get the plugs. Yeah, um, sales chatter tomorrow, eleven a.m. Eastern. Note the time change, folks. Um, with uh, Jeff Dickinson, Ryan Muhammad, eleven a.m. Eastern tomorrow. Landline now tomorrow night, seven p.m. on Sirius XM. Don't miss a great freight find podcast. Ian Jeffries president CEO of the Association of American Railroads, talking about the state of the railroad industry. Uh, DAT is going to be at the Mid-America Truck Show in just 30 days. It's the biggest truck show in the country. Uh, exclusive sponsorship of the Friday Night Conference. LB Shane is the headliner this year. You can only get uh, one of 15,000 tickets available at our booth. Um, TIA Capital Ideas Conference in Florida is on in 50 days. We'll all be there. Starts April the 19th. And remember, if you'd like to find out more about what's happening in freight, you can download the long firm version version of today's market update at dat.com forward slash market update. Thank you, Dean. Um, I don't think I think you covered it all. I don't think I have really anything to add. I'm looking forward to TIA coming up in April. Yep. Um, it's going to be a fun time. It'll be East Coast this year. Um, maybe swing the kids past Disney if you're heading out or Orlando, Universal Orlando. That'll be fun. Uh, but with that, we are going to log off. I won't see everyone next week, but I'm looking forward to catching up in a couple weeks. We hope everyone has a safe week, and we will talk to you later. Bye, everyone. Bye.